Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch. With me, Vikas Swaroop. Our channel, Sunset TV, has a tagline. It says, democracy matters. Democracy matters because it is the only political system that places power in the hands of the people. Democracy matters because it gives voice and choice to citizens to productively shape their world. Democracy matters because it embodies an idea of equality, that each individual has an equal vote, and that everyone, irrespective of race, class, or religion, is entitled to live a life of liberty, opportunity, and dignity. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, I understand democracy as something that gives the weak the same chance as the strong. That is what makes democracy such an appealing political ideal across different cultures and communities. India is justifiably proud of its status as the world's largest democracy. And we have a vital stake in the success of democracy worldwide. So as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of our independence, our Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav, we have reached out to 75 of our fellow democracies across the world and invited young leaders from each of those countries to visit India and see our democracy in action. The first lot of these distinguished visitors is currently in India, hosted by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations. And we are indeed fortunate to have three of them in the studio with us tonight, representing three different continents. From Tanzania, we have Mr. Al Hassan Mohidun Michuzi, a reporter working for Michuzi TV, who has a keen interest in journalism and mass communication. From Jamaica, we have Ms. Rhoda Moy Crawford. She has been a radio talk show host, a teacher, deputy executive director of the Jamaican Foundation for Lifelong Learning, a candidate for Doctor of Philosophy at the University of the West Indies, and now the youngest member of parliament in Jamaica representing Manchester Central since 2020. And lastly, we have someone from our own neighborhood, Mr. Jeevan Thondaman, the State Minister of Estate Housing and Community Infrastructure of Sri Lanka. He is a lawyer by training who interned at a law firm in London before joining active politics and being elected to the Parliament of Sri Lanka from the Nuwara Elia district in 2020. A very warm welcome to all of you. Now, you have been in India for the last one week. You have visited our parliament, interacted with our ministers and senior officials, seen the Taj Mahal and the Statue of Unity, visited the Indian Space Research Organization, the Amul Dairy and Sabarmati Ashram. What are your impressions of India? Let's start with you, Mr. Michuzi. Uh, my impressions about India are very positive. You know, the hospitality, the culture preservation, the happiness of the people in this country. It was really amazing. It was amazing being here. And this is your first visit to India, right? It is my first visit in India. Ms. Crawford, I believe this is also your first visit to India. Yes, this is my first visit and I'm very happy to be here in India. I've always wanted to, to visit India since I was a child. So I'm happy to be here and I want to use this opportunity to thank the government of India for extending this invitation and thank you, sir, for having us on your program. Not at all. So tell me, what about India surprised you or amazed you? Or... What amazes me most about India is the rich culture and the steps that are being taken to preserve the culture. What I love about the people of India is that they are very respectful and very hospitable. Fantastic. Now, Mr. Thondaman, you, of course, have been a frequent visitor to India. You did your schooling in India and you've visited India many times since. Tell us, how has India changed over the years? Well, I can tell you this. Um, India is like my second home. You know, in fact, uh, not only me, but my family also have been here and I consider it a privilege to have grown up in this part of the world. And um, as my colleague said, the rich culture and heritage cannot be replaced. And uh, there's one thing that I keep mentioning no matter what, is that Indians will always uh, live and breathe by, you know, Aditi Devo Bhava, just as God. And um, they have treated us no different. Ms. Crawford, you are a first time parliamentarian. So what made you decide to take the plunge into politics? Okay, what made me decide to enter into representational politics is the fact that I am from a poor family. I used to sell in the market with my parents. When my mother had to 
go to work. She would sometimes leave me with the neighbors. And these neighbors would help me to do my homework. Some would help me to pay, they would help to pay for tuition. They would feed me. And what I've seen over the years, the, the representative that we had in the constituency, the same issues that, that I saw growing up as a child, as an adult, those issues remain. And so I thought that if you really want to change, you cannot effect change from the sidelines. You needed to get involved, and so I decided to get involved so that I could transform my constituency and to give back to the people who made me into who I am today. Tell me, what is the role of gender in politics? As a woman, was it easier or more difficult for you to enter politics? Okay, so we all know that we are, we ha we're living in a society still believes that the woman's place is in the home, still believes that women have so many other responsibilities. And it is true, women have to think about family life, women have to think about balancing education. But for me, it wasn't at all difficult because in Jamaica, both political parties made an extra effort, and especially the ruling party from which I am, made an effort to ensure that more women were fielded in the last elections. And leading into the elections, we were provided with support from the senior women in the party and even the, the male figures. So it, it had helped us to transition. How does it feel to be the youngest MP from Jamaica? I think it's an honor, especially coming from Jamaica, where we have so many talented people, so many educated people, and to be in a parliament to represent the people of Jamaica, it is, it is an honor. Mr. Thondaman, you come from a political family. Your great-grandfather, your grandfather, your father, were all very prominent political leaders of Sri Lanka who represented the Indian origin Tamils in particular. So was politics a natural choice for you? Not at all. In fact, uh, I completed my law degree, as you mentioned earlier, and my idea was to use my law degree and apply it to the trade union uh, part of my party. And it was very unfortunate that during the course of elections, my uh, late father and late leader had passed away. And Only at the age of 56, I believe. 55, actually. 55. He was, uh, Three days shy of his uh, 56th birthday. And, um, you know, with that being on one side, you know, we have to look at his family being balanced on one side and the people on one side. And uh, I genuinely was able to address the issue of the people because mm. one issue that the people of Indian origin have in uh, Sri Lanka is that they have still not been integrated into mainstream society. Mm. And this is what I took forward as a message to the people. And if they didn't accept me, I wouldn't be sitting here. More specifically, they have been there for over 157 years. And when they have been there for over 157 years, it's a shame to say that they don't have rights to own land. And uh, this is the issue that they are facing you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So apart from this, there are other issues as well. So I put forward these issues in my manifesto to the people, especially with our dream, which has been a university for the Indian origin Tamils. And that, it's looking very likely in the following year. Excellent. Mr. Michuzi, you come from Tanzania, which is seen as one of the most stable multi-party democracies in Africa, a country where nationalism has managed to transcend tribalism. Yeah. So how was Tanzania able to do this? And what lessons does it hold for other countries in Africa? Uh, starting with how Tanzania was able to do this, I think it's the foundation of, uh, uh, we call them the fathers of our nation, Malim Nyerere and his government. They, they put forward um, the pan-Africanism and socialism, uh, which brought people together. The main thing was language, the Swahili language. He made sure all people speak Swahili language, so we come together. Also, he demolished the chiefdoms. You know, there were chiefs, different chiefs, tribes. So he demolished and made people as one. So I think that's what brought us together and there's no tribalism. And it's a crazy question asking someone, which tribe are you from? That's not in Tanzania. Yeah. Ms. Crawford, Jamaica has less than 3 million people, but it has a global influence. We in India know it as the birthplace of Bob Marley, Chris Gale, and Usain Bolt. So tell us, how has Jamaica been able to produce such outstanding musicians, cricketers, and of course, the fastest sprinters in the world. Some people say, do Jamaicans have a speed gene? <laughs> <laughs> no, to, to answer the question seriously, it, it's, it's embedded in our culture, in our sociali socialization. As people of Jamaica, we're taught to be committed. 
We're taught to be hardworking. We're, st we're taught stick to -tiveness. So it doesn't matter which area. Whatever Jamaicans get involved in, we are determined to do our best and to be the best. And that is what keeps us. Such as politics. But, but this is still, it's incredible, you know, that one after the other, you produce the top-notch uh, sprinters in the world who win all kinds of mm -hmm. Olympic records. So certainly, in, in terms of, is there something in the food of <laughs> <laughs> No, in terms of the sprinting, though, apart from natural talent, Jamaica has an, a, a, very, a very serious athletic program. So even at the primary level, we have sports day where persons, the, the athletes compete, students run against each other. The top runners are selected. Then there are regional championships at the high school level. Of course, we have boys and girls championship and it showcases the best athletes in secondary schools, in, in the secondary schools across Jamaica. And thereafter, many of these young people, they, they continue into professional athletics training. Mr. Thondaman, you represent the plantation workers of Sri Lanka, most of whom came from India. How have they maintained their links with the country of their ancestors? And what more can be done to strengthen this bond? Well, I must say, uh, sadly, we haven't maintained links. That is the problem. Because uh, if you look at it, mainly from southern parts of India and Kerala, of course, the workers had migrated uh, and, you know, they had come to Sri Lanka to work in plantation. And while they were working in plantations, they were subjected to a lot of atrocities. And as uh, sad as it is to say, it continued on till the early 20th century. And, um, you know, that's how unionism started and that's how the Salon Workers' Congress came to be. And one thing that we've noticed is that many of them cannot trace their roots back to India, you know, um, either because of lack of documents. But uh, I, in my personal opinion, and I don't mean this in a political way, some may say it's controversial, but um, I'm sure you're aware of the Shrima Sastri Pact. And when that pact came about, um, you know, as you're aware, the Indian Ocean Tamils were disenfranchised in 1948 and we didn't get our citizenship till, the, till 1977 when the pact came about. But unfortunately, when the pact came about, only a portion of the Indian Ocean Tamils were to be taken back to India while the remainder were to stay in Sri Lanka. So this was not fair by any means, in our opinion, because they were not first generation Indian Ocean Tamils. They were second generation, third generation, some even fourth generation Indian Ocean Tamils. So when some of them were taken back to India, this is what we call, uh, this, this part of our history, we call it the Opari coach. Okay. Coach is, as you're aware, it's called train. And Opari is a Tamil way of mourning. So, uh, you know, in a family of four, two people were forcibly sent back and two people were kept back in Sri Lanka. So this, this part of history is, uh, it, it goes without recognition. So due to that, you know, none of us were able to maintain our roots. But there are a few people who are able to maintain roots. But I must say this that under the current leadership of India, many of us have been able to, you know, trace our roots, not only trace our roots, but also gain benefits from the Indian government. For example, recently we were able to acquire about 14,000 houses to be built for the plantation workers. For that, we're thankful to the people and the government of India. And what more can we can be done so that these bonds get strengthened over time? The, see, if the bonds have to be strengthened over time, people should not let go of their roots. They should learn their identity and their history, which unfortunately we're not learning at the moment. And the only way we can learn our identity and history is with the help of our parent country, which is India. You know, Sri Lanka refers to India as the sister country. But us Indian origin Tamils, we refer to India as our parent country because this is our mother. Very well said. Thank you. Mr. Michuzi. Yeah. The COVID pandemic is still raging all across the world. Now we have a new dangerous variant called Omicron. How do you see the current status of the vaccination coverage in Africa? The current status of the vac vaccination, uh, we are a little bit lagging, lagging behind. Yeah, Speaking of my country, Tanzania, uh, vaccination process is still on, is an ongoing action. People are still coming. Yeah, there's influence from leaders. Yeah, like uh, we had different vaccinations and the first set of vaccine was, was over. So we had uh, new donations. So they're there and people are going for vaccination. Yeah, so we're going there. We're not slow, but we are going for the vaccine. Yeah. Ms. Crawford, what about Jamaica and the Caribbean? So in Jamaica, we have been able to so far administer more than 1 million doses, but there's still a bit of 
hesitancy. So what the government has decided to do, we have been more targeted. So we have opened more vaccination centers to make access to the vaccine easier. We, have also, we also have members of parliament from, from both political, major political parties going into their constituencies, encouraging persons to get vaccinated. And those who have a difficulty getting to the centers, we have been arranging transportation to get them there. We're also now taking vaccines to the homes to vaccinate people in their homes. So we, we see where the numbers are now rising. And what we have to continue to do is to counter the fake news that is out there. But, but we have been making positive strides. Mr. Thondaman, how has the COVID pandemic impacted the tourism sector in Sri Lanka? It had impacted the tourism sector very, um, you know, very abruptly. Apart from the tourism sector, pretty much all the other sectors took a hit as well. And, uh, including the plantation sector? Including the plantation sector. Because, you know, um, if, because uh, initially when COVID uh, came along, we went for a lockdown. And under lockdown, you know, there are certain issues, but people's safety is important. And as a government, we all did come together to try and do what was best. And I must thank the Indian government because they had donated vaccines to us without which we wouldn't be where we are right now. And also at the same time, I'd like to congratulate the Indian government on crossing 100 crore vaccinations. It's an achievement not only for India, but in our battle against the pandemic. But getting back to your question, the thing is in Sri Lanka, the tourism uh, sector took a very bad hit. But however, we are coming back. You know, right now we've uh, crossed about 80% vaccinations and all our government servants are vaccinated. Um, right now we are in the process of vaccinating school children. But as you said, the only issue is the new strain. But you know, we are looking to come out of it as well. And um, other than that, you know, it's, it's, there, there, there is something that I must say in this platform, even though it's a bit unrelated. I think the, I think COVID more than taking a hit on, more than, you know, giving a hit on people's livelihood. I think one thing that none of us actually spoke about is the domestic violence that took place. You know, there was a significant mm -hmm. rise in domestic violence in not only Sri Lanka, but in India and pretty much all over the world. And that, is something that needs to be addressed considering this is the 16 days of activism against intimate partner violence. So I just wanted to say that. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, all three of you come from countries with a multitude of languages and cultures, just like India. So tell us, how important is diversity to democracy? Let's begin with you, Ms. Coffey. Well, it's very important. First of all, Jamaica's motto says it all, out of many, one people. So. Jamaica is made up of people from all different races. Diversity is very important because it, help, it teaches tolerance and help us to be acceptance, accepting of differences. Mr. Michuzi? Uh, I'll agree more with Ms. Rhoda. Uh, you know, diversity uh, goes along with, the, as you said, the acceptance and uh, tolerance. tolerance. Yeah, so I agree more with her. <laughs> and Mr. Thondaman? Well, I'm sure you're aware of Sri Lanka's, uh, you know, political history. Yes. And uh, Sri Lanka has always been a nationalistic society, and especially in the political field. But unfortunately, that nationalist ideology is only with the politicians. And uh, the definition of nationalism is quite uh, blurred. Because uh, when I say I'm Sri Lankan, I mean I'm Sri Lankan. I don't mean I'm, I belong to any particular race, ethnicity or religious background. And I believe we are going towards a united Sri Lanka, which will include all races and all religions. And uh, I don't think that's far off. So we are getting there. Liberal democracies the world over are facing a number of challenges, from forces of terrorism and extremism, rising inequality and xenophobia, to the growing menace of fake news. What, according to you, should be done to strengthen democracy? Let's begin with you, Mr. Michuzi. Transparency. That's the In most... one sentence, I'll say, I'll choose transparency. As a reporter, I think this is an important <laughs> issue for you, mm. isn't it? Uh, it really is. Because uh, sometimes you feel that the government is not forthcoming enough. Yeah, sometimes we feel so, but uh, Tanzania, the government has really tried to be transparent. The next, they always tell us the next move, and when they make the next move, they call the media, make sure people know this, so that's what we do. Ms. Crawford? And I will go back to tolerance. And it starts there. Because if we are really, if democracy is really to work, and democracy is built on the principle of persons being able to, to have their own ideas and their own opinions, and, and it is to be respected. So we have to begin by teaching persons to be tolerant of each other's views, each other's position, 
and where there are disagreements, we should at least be respectful. Two, I believe the, 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 super, the countries that are more powerful would need to play a greater role in supporting developing countries. And I think this also brings in the question of vaccine uh, equity. Yes. Uh, which you were uh, talking about earlier. Yes. What do you have to say about that? So, of course, the COVAX facility that was implemented to mitigate against the superpowers being able to buy and store the vaccines or hoard vaccines. We all see that that wasn't the case. And so even back home in Jamaica, initially we struggled to get vaccines, not because we didn't have the resources, but because the bigger countries were buying them up. And we saw where many of these vaccines were, were expiring, expiring in these countries. And, you know, at this point too, I think it, it would be good to thank the government of India, because at one point when we struggled to access vaccines, the Indian government was very kind enough to donate batches of vaccine to the people of Jamaica. We're very grateful. We're very thankful. Minister Thondaman, what according to you should be done to strengthen democracy? Well, I couldn't agree with my colleagues more. Transparency and tolerance. Uh, transparency and tolerance. But at the same time, I must play devil's advocate here. Please. The thing is, <laughs> you know, I, my, my dear friend here, who I had the pleasure of spending seven days with, mentioned uh, transparency, transparency from the government. But at the same time, you know, the also, uh, you know, freedom of press must not be exploited for the wrong means. So it's, this is what I mean, you know, it has to go hand in hand. You know, um, they say media or press at the end of the day is the unsung opposition. So with that being said, that is my belief, with no <laughs> offense to my reporter or friend. And lastly, to answer your question, there's a really nice Tamil saying, you say, Yadu Mure Yavram Kelir. And um, that basically means every being in this planet is my kith and kin. And I think that's the principle we should go on. But you have rightfully highlighted the issue of fake news. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, and I think fake news has emerged as a really big problem for all democracies. Yeah. So how do we counter fake news? Uh, what is Tanzania doing to counter fake news? Is this a big problem in your country? Uh, yeah. We had different fake news to the world. Many people knew, you know, it, many people knew uh, Mount Kilimanjaro wasn't in Tanzania. <laughs> was in our neighboring country. <laughs> Many people knew Serengeti wasn't. But what we did, we started campaigns, you know, media campaigns, tourism campaigns. So people knew the exact where Kilimanjaro is, where Serengeti is. And the campaigns are still going on. Different things are told right now. Tanzanites are the only minerals found in Tanzania. But there were no, knew, no one knew where Tanzanites were. They never knew that they came from Tanzania. But right now, a lot of people know the Tanzanites are the Tanzanian gems. So the, the social media campaigns, the, med the press campaigns, really boosted that up. Is it a big problem in Jamaica too? Yes, it is. And the reality is we're never truly going to get rid of fake news. That's just the reality. Yes, we can put legislations in place to deal with, with missteps. But outside of that, I've always been, been a firm believer in the saying unless you begin to tell your story it will always be his story her story and their stories about you so so what i have been able to do as a politician and certainly many of my colleagues are doing that in jamaica social media even though it it could be good and it could be bad it's based on how you you choose to use it what social media has done for us in this information age it allows you the opportunity to tell your own story so for example as a as a parliamentarian Whenever I do work in my constituency, I'm able to use my social media pages to showcase the work that I'm doing. And if something comes out in the newspaper or wherever it's said, that's not the truth. I have the opportunity to, to clear up those misconceptions, misconceptions on my social media pages. But we're never truly going to get rid of, of, of fake news. Mr. Thunderman? Well, I, I firmly believe that legislation is one way. But like she said, it's never going to uh, disappear. It's not something that can be eradicated completely. But um, the reason I, I feel legislation is the main key factor in this is because legislation should not be used to curb freedom of speech, freedom of expression, but at the same time, it should be able to point a finger at the person accountable. for it. Now, for example, in Australia, I'm sure you're aware, uh, I believe the Australian government has taken steps to hold certain social media platforms accountable. And uh, if someone were to, let's say, use a fake ID or a fake um, identity, and just, you know, um, give out fake news. 
All it takes is that piece of legislation to force the person to come out of their true identity. Freedom of expression and freedom of speech is excellent. It's needed. But only when it is being used by the, by the, by the genuine person, not, not by someone who's hiding behind a veil of uh, bias. Well, thank you very much, uh, all three of my panelists, uh, for your insights uh, into your communities, your cultures, your countries, and especially on your take on democracy, you know, and, and what, it, uh, what we need to do uh, to strengthen it further. So all three of you come from three different countries, from three different continents, but hearing you, I think we all share one common theme, and that is that democracy matters. Yes. That is all I have for you tonight. Join me next week for another episode of Diplomatic Dispatch. Till then, good evening and goodbye.